from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to Still Growing. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. I have another great show for you today. Actually, it's kind of an exciting show because I'll be joined by my master gardeners and friends, and we are doing our very first Master Gardener Roundtable, which is something that we hope to do every other month here on Still Growing. But before I get too far into the show, let me just cover some of the usual housekeeping items before I get started. Don't forget, you can check out the show notes for still growing over at my website, sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you can find the still growing podcast in the top menu and then just scroll down to episodes or feel free to head on over to iTunes. You can give me a review there and also get the show there. If you happen to happen to be listening on Stitcher Radio, hit that little thumbs up button down in the corner. I'd really appreciate that. And let's get on to what's been happening around here. Just a quick side note, I have a little dog with, in addition to our regular dog, Sunny, um, we're actually watching a friend's dog while they're on vacation, and it's a little Yorkshire Terrier, and his name is Truffles, except around here... We call him Truffley, and I think we had to come up with something that kind of went with Sunny, and so we've got Sunny and Truffley, and every time I say it, I kind of say it with that Scarlett O'Hara flair, and I'm like, Truffley, Truffley, come here, Truffley, and he's a fun little dog. We, we've bathed him almost every day, and we put on little shirts for him. My husband calls him the dog with shirt, and uh, we've just had a lot of fun with him, but uh, getting back on track here, uh, talking about the garden a little bit. This week, I had the chance to put together a quick little segment for our local television station, and they wanted me to talk about August in the garden. And so I was thinking about August, and I was thinking about the time that I've been spending in the garden already in the last week. It's hard to believe we're already a week into August. So I did a little reflection on this time of year and how I think of gardening in the month of August. August to me really is the gardener's second chance at spring. In April, spring gardening is a strange combination of optimism and uncertainty. And after winter, we are so eager to see our gardens come to life. Yet in springtime, we're really gardening blind. We don't know about our winter losses yet. We have no idea about what has been self-sown in our garden. And summer's temperament is still a mystery to us. We don't know what's in store for us in the garden when we start out in April. August is a second chance to do or redo the garden chores that we couldn't fully appreciate back in April. In August, gardeners are tired, that's true. But if you can muster the energy to get into your garden, provided it's not oppressive outside, you will find you are a wiser gardener. By summer's end, gardeners can make decisions, selections, and plans based on fact. We know exactly what we're dealing with in our gardens. Why is the gift of August gardening so wonderful? Because we're truly able to evaluate our gardens and still have time to make them better. Here are some of my August gardening tips that didn't make the segment for Channel 12. Um, they didn't. They kind of got edited out in the post production, but I wanted to make sure that I shared some of them with you today. If you love climbers, consider planting extra climbing plants side by side in August. This is something that I learned a long time ago, but I have found it to be one of the things that I really enjoy the most about my garden, and that is whenever I have an opportunity for a climbing. Uh, plant, a space for a climbing plant, whether it's an arbor or a trellis or a fence, I always make sure to plant a variety of climbers together in that space. So on my blog, I show an arbor that's in my garden. And on this arbor, I have two climbing roses, one on either side. I also have two clematis, as well as grapes that are going over the arbor. And right now they're actually hanging down through the very top of the arbor and it's adorable. So um, that's what I mean by taking advantage of August. A lot of times climbers are on sale 
in August. And you can get these things relatively cheaply um, compared to uh, people who rush out and want to plant them in the spring. They've probably already bloomed, especially if you're thinking about getting a clematis or a climbing rose or or they're on the tail end of it if they're not um, completely done. But that's the beauty of planting in August. There's still time for these things to get established. And by the time next spring rolls around, you will have multiple blooms firing off at different times uh, during your summer. And you'll just be so thankful that you took the time in August to plant those extra climbers. Emma and I um, also had an opportunity um, to demonstrate sowing for the fall harvest. And of course, you know, with the vegetables that we're sowing right now, everything in the cabbage family, the lettuce, the spinach, all of those things, I think, end up tasting better and doing better because they're being sown in a very warm Uh, period of time. You don't have to worry about hardening them off or, um, or, you know, worrying about grow lights, things of that nature, because you're direct sowing outside. And then as they mature, the temperatures are getting a little bit cooler. And I always find that fall harvest to be just a little better tasting or, or maybe it's just that it's less rushed. But in any case, I feel like I always have time to really enjoy that harvest. And so I'm looking forward to that one. In the uh, blog post for this um, segment, I'm also demonstrating my favorite garden tool, which is the Dig It. Um, I use that thing every day. In fact, I've got three of them in my garden tool bag. And um, one of the nice things about it is that it does help you plant because it's got this nice trough. Um, But it's also a fabulous weeder, and that's probably what I use it the most for. But I do enjoy it for planting seeds, and so you'll see me using it to plant seeds in my raised bed in that piece. The other thing I love doing in August is giving my garden a little top dressing of mulch. It's not uh, the heavy dressing that I'll put on um, for winter time, but it does help to clean things up in the garden. And when I'm going through and starting to do some of my fall cleanup activities, I'm going to get a head start on those right now with the spring flowering plants that are all done. Um, and then also just some things that look tired. I'll probably start taking those things to the ground. But as I'm doing that, I'll also be going around the garden and adding some mulch. And that just makes the whole Uh, garden look better, fresher, and ready for the back half of summer. My other piece of advice regarding August is to make harvesting part of your daily routine in August because things happen so quickly with our summer harvest and this particular month that it can easily get out of control. If you're finding that you have so much produce that you can't get to it all, maybe open up your garden and invite your neighbors or your church to stop by once a week, help you pick things from your garden, donate to your local food shelf. I have made a habit of going out in my garden early in the morning. I'm usually still in my pajamas and I'm harvesting. And that's generally where my kids find me as they're waking up in the morning. And it's a fun thing that we kind of do together as well. But the benefit of harvesting in the morning is that as you're harvesting, you can be thinking about your meal preparation and how you want to utilize that harvest. Or let's say you have um, some errands planned Who doesn't like getting some fresh tomatoes or some fresh cucumbers or a zucchini? Um, So you can throw those things in your car. I've got a little crate that I carry with and uh, people are always thrilled to get that that gift of harvest um, from their gardening friends. August is not the time to give up on weeding. The thing that I actually kind of get a little uh, chuckle out of as I'm garden or as I'm weeding in in August is that um, some of the weeds are really doing a very good job of camouflaging themselves. I mean, they are really trying to hide uh, as best they can so that they make it through the summer as well. But I do have to chuckle sometimes. Um, I've and, and tonight was a great example. I was out in the garden. And there was a a weed that was growing in with my mint. And I mean, I had walked past this thing, I don't know, three or four times today. But tonight when the sun was kind of just going down and I was going through that final pass through the garden, here I see this weed that had just 
just tried to turn itself into some mint and it was not obviously doing it perfectly, but it had done it well enough that I missed it multiple times today. Last but not least, take uh, pictures of your garden. And and I encourage you to have someone else take pictures of your garden, whether it's a friend or you hand your iPad or your iPhone or your smartphone to your kids. And I usually say, I give them a challenge. I say things like, go take 100 pictures of mommy's garden. Go take 50 pictures of mommy's garden and then come back. I guarantee you that you will see things in your garden through those pictures that are taken uh, you know, at the hands of someone else. You'll see your garden in a new way and you're going to notice the successes and the opportunities in areas that you maybe haven't seen before. I also love that as a tool that I will use in the wintertime as I'm trying to make informed decisions and plans for next year's garden. Later this weekend, I'm going to be sharing my top 10 August gardening chores. That'll be on my blog by Sunday. Um, But that's the view from up here this week. Let's get into the show. This show is our very first Master Gardener Roundtable, and it's featuring my friends and fellow Master Gardeners, Mary Lynn Kenknight, Jamie Sled, and Marilyn Arnland. Let's go to the roundtable. So welcome to my Master Gardener Roundtable. I'm going to have each of you take a second and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Mary Lynn Knight, and I'm working with my first pest detector class. It's actually through the DNR, and it is for detecting insects and diseases that are new to the area and being a first detector. Also informing the DNR if you've seen something and they will come out and confirm it. You get the most wonderful emails from that program. I have received a couple already, mainly on the Emerald Dashboard. Enemy number one. Right, exactly. All right, Jamie, you want to go next? I do. My name is Jamie Sled. I'm a master gardener. My day job, I'm a dentist, sometimes known as a gum gardener. A gum gardener? But you could delete that. No, I love that. (laughs) Marilyn? Hi, I'm Marilyn, and I'm a master gardener, too. And I'm also a Minnesota Tree Care Advisor, so I kind of like to specialize in trees and shrubs. I am a firefighter and fire marshal um, for my real career. And you've been doing that a long time, and you're getting ready to retire, aren't you? I hope so. Um, I'm on, I'll start my 28th year in August. Wow. How long are you planning on going? Well, I'd like to, I'd like to make 30. We'll see. Okay. Well, we'll cross our fingers, right? Yep. Okay. So, ladies, what are you seeing in your garden? I currently have leaf miner. Leaf miner. And it's affecting my upatorium or my joe pie weed. And it's the first time I've ever seen a joe pie weed affected by leaf miner. Tell us what you're seeing for uh, people who aren't familiar with it and what well, you're doing to take care of it. This was an unusual case because I've usually seen the leaf miner in my columbine. And then you can see the trails that the leaf miner is leaving behind. This one, the actual leaf was completely translucent. Hmm. And so I wasn't even clear that it was a leaf miner. So I looked it up on the the Hennepin County Extension site. And it is a leaf miner. And when I picked the leaf up, I could actually see the leaf miner for the very first time with the naked eye just by holding it up to the light inside the leaf. And so what was recommended cool. was to pick the leaves off that are being affected and just getting rid of them in your trash can. How bad is the infestation? It was actually probably five or six leaves. So it oh, wasn't that's bad. all? Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. I actually thought it was sun scald. It looked very similar to that. And I know that in the summertime, you can have sun scald on your plants. But when I picked it off, I could actually see the worm, the leaf miner on the inside. And it's just a little tiny worm that's a li- about quarter of an inch long. And do you have an issue with Joe Pye seeding itself all over your yard? Yes. You do? I do. And what do you do about that? This is for sure I've seen that actually. Um, And it's easy to pull out because I have a lot of landscape, Mm -hmm. not landscape edging, but the landscape fabric with the mulch over the top of it. So the Joe Pye really can't root that deeply into my soil. So honestly, just pulling it out when I see it is all I have to do. So do you, um, well, for instance, today, I had uh, the girls helping me garden, 
and they were pulling out five foot tall Joe Pye weed. Wow. I'm embarrassed to say, but with the garden <laughs> tour, my own garden kind of uh, slid my own garden duty. So, um, do you pull it when it's when it's fairly young then, or what's your strategy for that? Well, honestly, um, yeah, the Joe Pye I pulled out today was probably only five or six inches tall. Very easy to. Oh, you show off. <laughs> Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, so much for that five foot Joe Pie gone astray, huh? Yes. Well, I fell in love with it, and I'm assuming you're growing Gateway as well, the yes. large variety. Yes, although I do have the the smaller variety as well. Oh, well, you do. But I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. But do you like the smaller variety as well, or not? Um, it doesn't seem to flower as profusely, but I think in the right location, it is in a little bit more of a shaded location. Um, doesn't get as much sun as the gateway. And so I think that's another reason why it's not flowering as much. But um, I do really love the Joe Pie because it is one of the best plants for attracting butterflies in the fall. I've gone out and I have counted 12 monarch butterflies on my Joe Pie weed in the fall. Well, and I leave mine up all winter long for the birds because they absolutely love it. I do as well. And then it's actually very easy to take out in the spring because it just kind of snaps off right at the base. It gets really woody. Yep, exactly. So that's another tip for people. And you have the winter interest. You do. You have winter interest, which in Minnesota is a very important thing to have. You had a question for Marilyn about iris. I do. At the garden tour, I had a person that came up and asked me a question about iris. And she planted iris about two years ago, and it hasn't bloomed. And I asked her the conditions, if it was getting enough sun, and she did say that it wasn't in full sun all day long. But have you ever had any experience with your irises not blooming? They need tons of sun to bloom. And so even if they're in a part sun situation, they probably won't bloom. Do they need to be fertilized at all? Well, I don't think that'll help them bloom. They need sun. Okay. And they probably need sun at least six to eight hours. So from like nine in the morning till three in the afternoon, minimum. So that's the intense sunlight. I think people are sometimes too nice to their iris, too. They don't want to be planted very deeply. Right. They don't want to be wet. They like to kind of skim along the surface of the soil. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. And they love to be split. When you split them, and if hers are very young, so that can't be a problem, but if you can split your irises every three years, they will just bloom profusely. They love being split. How do you do it, Marilyn? Tell us a little bit more about your technique for splitting iris. I just dig up the whole clump, and I just break them apart or cut them apart, and then just replant. I always soak them in bleach, um, bleach water, like nine to one parts. Oh. And um, Why are you doing that? Just to make sure that there's no fungus or any iris spores. It just is a good thing to do. Wow, I have never soaked my iris. I always do. How long do you soak them for? At least overnight. And then rinse it real well before you put it back in the ground, or does yeah, that I not just, matter? I just spray them with the hose. I take them out of the bleach water, and then I just spray them off really good. Do you? I'm struggling with iris leaf spot right now. And do you do anything to treat the soil before you put them back in, or would you not put them back in that, in that same spot? The leaf spot is a virus, so if, you, if you're concerned about, because the virus can be in the soil, mm-hmm. you could dig it out and put new soil in that area. Mm-hmm. I've done that before. I thought I had leaf borer or um, iris borer one time, and I dug out the entire area and just threw all the soil away and put fresh garden soil back in and then soaked all my irises in bleach water, you know, nine parts to one, and then replanted them. Yeah. Okay, I have a question about cutting back the leaves. Do you cut back the leaves as soon as the iris is done blooming or do you wait until the fall to cut them back? You're supposed to wait until the fall to cut them back just because that allows the rhizome to be ready for, you know, in the next year. It, it just gives it more energy goes into the rhizome if you don't cut the leaves off. I mean, sometimes I'll have some that are kind of in the way for other flowers, so I will cut them off, but on a whole, I try not to until fall. That's the best time. And then do you cut them at an angle, or do you cut them in a point? Well, you know, however you cut them is just for looks. Okay. Do you have something going on in your garden you want to share? Well, 
Weeds, 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 weeds. Perfect. Let's start with that. I finally weeded my garden. I have a lot of weeds this year that I have never seen before, and some of them I'm struggling to identify. Uh, Yesterday I went through three different weed books. I went online to two different weed sites, and some of it I just can't identify, and got everything that I can confirm as a weed. I got it all cleaned out, and I have to tell you, my garden's beautiful right now. Tell us about some of your plant purchases this summer, things that you're really happy with, things that you'd recommend for other people to try buying. One of my favorite things in my garden is a huge Annabelle hydrangea that Marilyn actually gave me three years ago when I first started it. It is spectacular. How big is it? It's probably four feet tall, and each of the flower heads is probably eight inches across. Okay. And when that sun hits them, it's just this beautiful white ball. It's gorgeous. Hmm. Now, do you stake it at all? I don't. Okay. And are they kind of flopping open or not? Not at all. They're not flopping apart? No. They're standing up real tall. All right. Do you have those in your garden, Marilyn? You know, I do. I had them in the front of my house, and they weren't working out well in my landscape. So I took them out, and I put them in my garden, too. And I, where they're in my garden, they are so happy and doing exactly the same thing. And they're really pretty shady, and so is yours. So is mine. So they're both in pretty shady spots, and they just couldn't be happier. Wow. When they were, Why weren't they working out in that initial location in the front? Is it too much sun? I think they got too much sun, and they flopped. And I think the sun did that to them. I also have Annabelle's along the side of my garage, uh, not from the same planting of, that Marilyn gave me, and they do flop. Oh, they do. They're not as pretty as what I have in the back. But they're mm-hmm. not in the shade that they are in the back either. It's very true. Mm-hmm. Very true. I know when we were at Roz's garden, she has a beautiful Annabelle in the front of her house, and we were all commenting that it, it looked so straight, and mm-hmm. she said that they stake it right when it's starting to come out of the ground and tie it together. Oh, really? So that when it starts to leaf out and bloom... They don't have to worry about it flopping apart. Hmm. So I have three invincibles. Invincible. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, yes. they're gorgeous. Yeah, how's the, how are they? Because I don't have any beautiful. of those. Oh. They're the whole plant. All three of them are just covered top to bottom in pink blossoms. They're spectacular, and they're like all different sizes. The blossoms, and they bloom all the way down by the close to the ground, all the way up. They they are just amazing. I every time I drive by, I'm just I just like, oh, I love those. <laughs> now, is that the one that you and I were talking about, Mary Lynn? Was that the breast cancer? Yes. yes. One? Okay, because yeah. actually, I did get three of those this this year, uh-huh. but I just tucked them in my front garden, mm-hmm. and of course, when I got them, they had a bloom on them, and then they were turning brown. So I chopped them off to the ground, and I just I let them sit in there. But I figured they'll come along. They what do will. you think? They will. They're quick growers. Yeah. yeah. Leave them till next year. Leave them. How are you finding the the growth habit? Are they are they staying true to what was advertised? Are they about two to three feet across, mm-hmm. or do they get a little bigger than that? No, they're pretty true to size. Okay, that's great. And I cut mine back last fall. You and did. They, yeah, and they came back beautifully. Did you cut them to the ground? Oh, probably a foot, foot and a half. Okay. While we're on the topic of pruning, what are you gals doing in the area of pruning? This year I'm finding I when things are done blooming, I'm tired of them, and I'm taking things to the ground. I'm doing much more cleanup along the way this year than I have in the past, and it's probably a function of my stress level, too. I'm trying to make things easy on me for a fall cleanup, but are there plants right now that you're doing that with that you are taking to the ground? Sunny's tail is going here. Um, the plants that you're taking to the ground or that you're uh, pruning back severely that you that you do as part of your July August garden chores. I really cut back my wild geraniums, and I may get a little spotted flowering here and there after cutting it back, but. I think it just looks so much better. I'm not cutting it back severely to the ground, but enough to clean up the the dead heads, and even a little bit more than that. But on the other hand, my lupins, I love lupins, and while some of them, quite a few of them actually are still blooming, I love the seed pods. Yeah. I love seeing just this little spire of seed pods Mm -hmm. and knowing that they're going to drop and I'm going to have great new little lupins next year Mm -hmm. 
What kind of soil do you have? Because I cannot get lupins to grow in my yard. Oh, I have icky clay. Mm-hmm. Wow. Very alkaline clay. Yep. And it's sun? It's a mixture. I've got some areas of sun, but I've got quite a bit of shade as well. I, huh. I put them in the southwestern corner right over here. And um, they get sun. They get afternoon sun and they get evening sun. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were thrilled over there. And that's probably one of my worst soil locations. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe maybe your soil is too good, Mary Lynn. Did you add compost to Nothing. the location over there? Did no. You? Well, I'll have to try lupin because I do love the look mm-hmm. of lupin. I think it's really pretty. And well, and we know from the last time we were together that Tom loves lupins, Jamie's husband. My husband loves lupins, and, and this is for the New Zealand listeners of this podcast. Tom and I got married in New Zealand, oh. and you will drive down the, the roadsides in New Zealand, and the medians are full of these gorgeous blooming lupins, and that's why we have lupins in our yard. Hmm. Tom loves them. And we found lupins when we went to, um, is it Bayfield? Bayfield, yes. They have just fields after fields after field of lupine. Bayfield, Wisconsin. Yes. Yes. Absolutely amazing. Ladies, is it lupine or lupin? See, and I I say it both ways. (laughs) I say lupin. You say lupin. Lupin. Yeah. I, I think I've said lupine until I started hanging around you. And now yeah, I I've, always, I've said both. I say lupine, and the next time I'll say lupin. Wow, I'm a strong leader. That'll, that'll, <laughs> that'll be our homework assignment for next time. That's we'll a look great it up. assignment. We'll, we'll look, look it up. up. So, you're cutting back your geranium. What else are you cutting back, ladies? I cut back my columbine. I cut back mm-hmm. my delphiniums. And when you're cutting them back, how far how far are you going when you're cutting I don't go them? all the way to the ground right now. Just... Unless I need the room because of another flower. So I just cut it off enough to make it look good. Mary Lynn? I do not cut anything back in my yard until the following spring, usually. I may try cutting back my napita Mm -hmm. because of what you said, Mm -hmm. which was you cut it drastically back, and then it comes out of the ground again with nice new foliage. Yeah. And flowers again. And the cat mint. Yep, that's the cat mint. Yeah. And I have both the walkers low and the and the standard. And I use it as a hedge uh, along one of my basement windows because it's very fragrant. Yeah. And I can cut it completely completely to the ground in the winter. And then when we're having a party, I can slide that basement window open and then we can cool our drinks out there. So I like that 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 there's nothing there when the when the cat mint dies completely back to the ground but right now when it starts to after it's done with that initial bloom it looks kind of shaggy and so i'll just come through and i will severely prune it almost to the ground and it'll send up new growth and you'll even get a a second bloom so Hmm. it's nice and and then it's nice and it's it's fluffy and it's not that ragged um woody kind of like the russian sage i keep i prune my russian sage back until about the fourth of july so that it doesn't get that woody stem i don't like that on my russian sage marilyn and i did a presentation for a garden club in i believe it was may and one of the women in the audience was talking about pruning her asters Mm -hmm. in june for the, your asters to get real tall and leggy, and I've yes. got one, and I can't remember what one it is, but I find that it gets so floppy by the end of yes. August before it blooms that I'm really having to stake it. So I pruned this one in June, and right now it's looking gorgeous. Yes. Hasn't bloomed yet. Is it the purple one with the yellow center? Yes. Yep, I have the same one. I had a neighbor give it to me, actually, because she thought it was a low-growing, and this Mm -hmm. thing gets about four feet tall. Mm -hmm. And I do the same thing. It's back with my mint, so that prompts me to take care of it, because I'm always ruthlessly pulling my mint out. Mm -hmm. But then I I take that aster, and I keep pinching it back until about the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Same thing with my sedum. I'll take that. And, you know, with your sedum, anytime you chop the top off your sedum, you can take that and plant it, and you'll have new sedum just from the tops of your sedum plants. What kind of sedum? Uh, just a standard sedum. I'm trying to think. What would you call like that? Like your autumn neons, joy? Yeah. autumn joy. Yeah, autumn joy. Autumn joy sedum. 
I take it, I chop the top off, put it in dirt in a pot or in the ground. You can direct plant it in the ground and you'll have a whole new sedum plant. But they said to do the same thing with that, like you do with your aster. Just take it, chop it off, keep it nice and low until about the 4th of July, and then let it go because Autumn Joy will kind of do that too. It'll It'll sprout out and then it flops. And I hate that. Oh, I would have been afraid to cut off the the flower buds. That's that's, that's what my initial I thought was, but I didn't. And they still and it works. Will bloom. They still bloom. Interesting. Huh. And I've heard Russian sage as well to cut back Russian oh, Russian sage. Yeah. Otherwise, it flaps. I was so eager to grow Russian sage. I bought twelve little baby Russian sage plants, and I grew them in this growing bed that I had. And then I moved them, and now they're on my south patio garden. And it is so invasive. Once it gets established, it grows right up through the middle of my patio, right through the polymeric sand. Wow. When that stuff wants to grow, there's wow. no stopping it. It is it is insanely aggressive. Do you know I have um, I have a garden in my backyard that's probably about 150 feet long. I don't know. 12, 15 feet deep, maybe? At least. Yeah, somewhere like that. And I have tons and tons of flocks in my garden. Um, It's just like scattered throughout this whole garden. It's a cottage garden. And it's kind of like scattered throughout. And I think I have every color that has ever been created. And I love it. It's like one of my favorite flowers. And this year, I have it sporadically looking like it has iron chloride. Chlorosis. Chlorosis. And um, I went to Butterfly Gardens in Maple Grove and talked to them there and showed it to them. And through my research, that's what I thought it was. Not sure. And they agreed that it was that. We looked for spiders. We looked for webs. We looked for bugs. Um, I didn't do anything different this year except the liquid fence had some fertilizer boost in it that I use because I use liquid fence for the deer and rabbits because I love flax. And it the, the, the whole plant, the whole plant, the leaves um, are turning yellow and the vines are very green, which is very typical symptom of iron chlorosis. But then in addition to that, the leaves though are kind of like curling. Our soil is very alkaline. I have done soil tests, and I think I'm going to do them again now that I have this. Um, because I already know that our soil, because I had taken four soil tests. How many years ago was that, Jamie, we did that? Four. Four years ago. And our soil, I did four of them, and it was 8.2 to 8.4, which is extremely high. Yeah, it is. And it gets very hard for plants to take up nutrients when the soil is so alkaline. Oh. And But what's so odd about this is why is it just affecting some of the flock sporadically through my garden? And so I have been treating it with morassid. Okay. And how's that working for you? I've only done one treatment now because it says only to do it, I think, weekly. So I've done one treatment. And, I, and it says you should notice some change, and I can't say that I'm noticing a huge change. But it also says to spray it on the leaves, which I didn't do. So the next treatment, I'm actually going to mix it and then spray it on the leaves as well as water the ground and see if that helps it. But they say in my research, I found out that that is short term. And when you have a cottage garden, it's not like you can dig things into the soil. No. You don't have the room to do that. No. So I'm, I'm really pretty devastated with the results of what's happening in my garden right now. Now, did Kathy at Butterfly Gardens agree with you that it was iron chlorosis? Yes. And then there was another gentleman there, too, that was very... That looked at it, looked at the plant, because I brought some of the plant, pieces of the plant mm-hmm. in. And he looked at it immediately and said, yep, iron chlorosis. He says, you just have a nutrient deficiency, possibly, in your soil. Um, and so I... That's how I'm treating it, but I'm. It's kind of scary that it isn't something that I can do. That's more long term because if you can't fix this sooner or later, it'll kill the plants. If it doesn't get better, it'll kill all my flocks. Is this the picture that you sent us? Yes. Okay. We'll put it on the website. Actually, if you look, see how the veins are really green and the rest of the plant is turning yellow. Oh yeah. 
I had to really enlarge this thing to see it. Yeah, but yeah, the veins are very, very dark green, and the rest of the plant is turning yellow. It, and but it's those... the leaf curling that doesn't go along with with um, the iron chlorosis. It's almost making like a ruffle on the end. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're ru- yeah they're curling in, kind mm-hmm. of ruffling in a way. You know, I am going to do another soil test now. Um, even though I did a soil test just a few years ago, I'm going to do it again. I think I need to do that. That anytime you're having problems or trying to figure out something, um, do a soil test. So I'm, I will be doing that. If I want to do a soil test in my yard, can you tell me how to do that? Well, if you go to the University of Minnesota Extension Service and Google soil test, a form comes up um, for the soil test that you can print. It's two sided. Um, and there's actually directions that tell you how to do it. And I think you can actually take soil from different areas and mix it and like just put it in a Ziploc baggie and then double bag it and mail it to them or drop it off. But I'm almost thinking that I don't know that I'll do that. I think I might just take my soil test from one area where these plants are really showing the symptom. But it tells you how deep to go. You know, you, you just... Dig down into the soil. If you have lawn, you have to, you know, cut the lawn away and then dig the soil out. But I think it says, like, go three to five inches deep down into the soil. I'd have to look back at that soil test form because it's been a couple of years. Do they send you a report? Oh, they send a very itemized report. Yeah. And when you get that report, how do you know what to do? How do you know if they say your soil is, for instance, my soil is very alkaline, will they tell me what to do to amend my soil? They, yeah, they should tell you what to do to amend it. You know, they'll tell me if I need organic material. They'll tell me, you know, what the nitrogen level is, what the phosphorus level is. They'll tell me all of that, and they'll actually tell me how to amend it. And then not only that, but once you know what your soil is, then you know what you can grow really well, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I tried to grow azaleas in my garden, I mean, three times, and I finally figured out after my soil test, no wonder these plants die in my garden they can't live in alkaline soil. So, you know, rhod- rhododendrons are yeah. the same thing. I, I mean, they're the just going thing. to do a very slow death over a year or two years, and they're going to die. Okay. And I figured that out once I had my soil test. Voila, now I know why they won't live here. Yeah. And when Don Ingebrigtsen was on, he said, you know, these plants require gardening. <laughs> you know, rhododendrons and azaleas. It's not like you can just plant them and forget them. Mm-hmm. So they need a little extra care, especially up here. Mary Lynn, what are you doing in your garden right now? Oh, I have my straw bale garden. Oh, tell us about oh. your straw bale garden. How's it going? What have you done with it? Well, I actually spoke with Joel, Joel Karsten at one of the gardens uh, after the garden tour. And I realized that one of my tomato plants had blossom and rot and he said so he recommended putting a tablespoon of powdered milk in the hole when you plant your vegetables that get the blossom and rot which would be your peppers and cucumbers and tomatoes and then that will help because rot, blossom and rot is a result of calcium deficiency eggplant Eggplant. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking maybe the straw bale gardening, because right now I'm using a fertilizer that is fish emulsion, which I thought would have calcium in it because of the bones from the fish. Mm-hmm. And But I'm assuming that it's not enough calcium, and I'm going to have to add the powdered milk mixture to it and see if that helps with the blossom. So would bone rot. meal add that? Well, think? I would think bone meal would have calcium because of I, I've never heard of powdered milk before. That's interesting. I hadn't either. That was what he recommended. Oh. And I'm all for trying the organic yeah. methods first. Are you too late or is, it, is there well, time to save them? This is mid-July when we're recording this. so. Right. My tomatoes have a lot of flowers on them still. Okay. So that's a good question. I don't know if blossom and rot is a result of when the tomato is blooming or if it's after it's already set fruit. Okay, and how did you notice it? The bottom of the fruit, if you're looking at it from the top, it looks normal, but if you're looking at it from the side or the bottom, the bottom is completely black and it looks like it's rotting. 
Hmm. And it's actually uh, indented most of the time. And I have a sad story. I picked the tomato off and then ended up breaking just partially the branch that it was on. Hmm. So it split where the two branches came together. Oh, Oh, no. And so I left it. And so far, the tomato plant is surviving. But we'll see what happens in the long run. I'm assuming once the tomatoes get large enough, it's going to... It's going to split more. Yes, it's going to cause some issues with that branch, but... You could tie it. That's a good idea. Just tie the stake branch it. together? Yeah, or tie it and stake it. Tie it and mm-hmm. stake it. Okay, so with what kind of a stake? Just a regular, like a bamboo stake? Yeah. Well, that's okay. what I was thinking, something okay. like that. I'm mm-hmm. going to try it. I'll report back to you and see if I was yes. successful. And yeah, that'd be interesting. Bone meal is primarily calcium and phosphorus. Okay, so there we have it. Bone meal would be a good option. Yeah. And what about fish emulsion? Does it say anything about that? I can look it up. One thing this is saying is lime is also a source of calcium. And lime would be acid, right? No. No. Lime is alkaline. Alkaline. Hmm. Gypsum, though, would, would, it would change it. Gypsum would, be, would make your alkaline soil less, more neutral. Okay. I'm learning a lot about chemistry today. Because alkaline is considered to be sweet. Because what was that? Alkaline soil is considered to be sweet. That's what the the farmers used to taste their soil to see what if the soil was. That's what they were doing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) Yeah. Davesgarden.com has a definition of sweet soil. And he said it's an old-fashioned term used to denote soil that is limey or alkaline. And it originates from when settlers moving westward would stop at a desirable homestead site and test the soil by tasting a bit of soil. Alkaline soil has a sweet taste, especially when compared to acidic soil, which is sour. Or bitter, yeah. And your soil is alkaline, right? In your yard? Extremely alkaline. Oh, extremely alkaline. And then you know what I also did, you guys? Hmm. I decided to find out if the watering can make it worse because if our soil is really alkaline in Maple Grove, then is the water also alkaline? So I called the utilities supervisor at Public Works this afternoon and asked him, and he said our our water is 7.2 to 7.6. So that's... So it's somewhat Which, alkaline. Yeah. Also. <laughs> 7.2, I would say 7.2 to 7.4. While 7 is true neutral, a lot of plants grow well in 7.2 to 7.4. Okay. So the 7.6, while, yes, it's leaning more towards the alkaline side of the scale, um, I would wonder about all of the other components, the iron, for example, that's, oh, the that's minerals in the water. All of the minerals in the Which water. Which is extremely heavy yeah. in Maple Grove. So here regarding fish emulsion, this is from rollitup.org, uh, the growing room for organics. It says that fish emulsion is especially high in phosphorus and calcium. Oh, Plus it has amounts calcium? of nitrogen. You're, you are getting so I'm doing the calcium. right thing, and I didn't even know it. That's great. But you love fish emulsion because you I have it in your garage all the time. I do. I use fish emulsion in well, my potted plants. Tell us how you use it, Mary Lynn. Go for it. I use fish emulsion in a big scrub pail that you would use if you were mopping your floors. And a lot of times I have rainwater that I've collected, and I just dump the fish emulsion in there until it looks the right color. And what's that? In your mind, describe in the my color. mind. It's cloudy gray. So, like you just finished scrubbing your floor. Like I just <laughs> exactly yes. That's what my floor, my my mop bucket water looks like. And then I just pour it onto my plants, and I probably do it once a month. I think I should increase it to probably once every three weeks, maybe once every two weeks. Why? We've had a lot of rain, and I'm watering my plants a lot, and I'm washing out a lot of the nutrients, and I think that my plants just are suffering if they don't have enough of the fertilizer. And I want to use it because I want to use an organic type of fertilizer, not the miracle Grow. How'd you get on to using it? Actually, there were some neighbors in my old neighborhood that used fish emulsion throughout their whole yard, and they're 
they had a front yard garden where the whole front yard was flowers hmm. and they used fish emulsion to to fertilize everything and i believe that fish emulsion is also good for the microorganisms in your soil oil that's from the other types of fertilizers actually stunt the growth of microorganisms and i wanted to just try to promote that in my in my soil and i save all of the soil from my pots and put them into my compost so i was hoping to keep my compost organic as well and do you ever um take the fish emulsion and and just bury it into the soil without liquid or without adding liquid or no I have not done that. It says that it's a pretty potent fertilizer, so that it's not recommended to use a large amount of fertilizer. And that's why I use a two-gallon scrub pail and put in about two to three tablespoons. And what do you do to control the odor? Oh, there's nothing you can do. It takes a day or two days in order for the smell to go away. Where do you store your mop bucket? I store it on my deck. You do? Yes. Yes. You can't bring it into the house. You can't use it for mopping. You can't store anymore. it in the garage. No, you can't store it in the garage either. It has to be on my deck. Does it keep critters away or does it draw critters that smell? Well, my dog really likes it a lot. He walks around the deck and sniffs every single pot. So I'm thinking it probably attracts critters. Yep. Although I haven't had an issue with my straw bale garden other than the very first month I had the deer come up and the deer the The one deer deer that's in my yard (laughs) came up and snipped off the tops of most of the plants including my tomato plants which i've never had a tomato plant yuck that's been eaten by a deer have any of you ever had tomato plants never Never. Uh uh-uh never i was they must have been really hungry yeah he's not even welcome in the herd he's just on his own that's right if he's eating tomato plants they don't want him Yeah, and he ate my pepper and a little bit of my lettuce. Well, Mary Lynn and I were working so hard on the garden tour, I did not get in my garden for the last three weeks, basically. And the weeds have taken over, so I'll be out there just pulling weeds. We had three bags of weeds that we pulled today, and there'll be a lot more. Isn't it amazing when you walk by your garden, when you think you have been pulling weeds, you walk by your garden and you stop and you see this. I had some people come over to my house on, I think, Sunday And they just came over to see the garden. And we're walking along and looking at the garden. And it was like four different times I saw these weeds, a weed that was as big as the other flowers. And it was like, oh, my gosh, how did I miss that? Yeah. (laughs) It drives you nuts. I'm interviewing this master gardener named Nancy Peters. And she's written a book about 10 ways you can tell if it's a weed. It's available on Kindle for 10 bucks if you're interested. Mm. What's the name of it? It's Nancy Peters, the weed lady, and it's called Weed ID Secrets Revealed, 10 Ways to Tell if It's a Weed. So if you have an iPad or a Kindle, something, an e-reader, you can get her book. And one of the things, um, I'm at the point where um, she, she asks you her 10 questions. And so as you're going through the 10 questions, she's bringing up examples of weeds that kind of fit into that category. But one of the things that she said, and it didn't necessarily pertain to weeds, but it kind of pertained to garden thugs. And that is if you have a plant that's really aggressively taking over in an area, just categorize it as a weed. And I don't know what I had growing in my front garden, but it was a purple plant. A bellflower? No, it wasn't a bell. It wasn't. It was like the whole thing was purple. Mm. It was a purpley, um, almost like a penstemon, you know, that beard tongue, that purple one. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what it looked like. It's not that, though. Um, And I... I pulled a lot of it last year. I think I was sympathetic and left one or two. And next thing you know, it's everywhere again. It's invasive. And so today I was out there with my garden girls, and I said, that's it. This is all going. Should we talk August uh, to-do list, things that that are on your to-do list that you're planning on working on? I know we talked about ordering spring bulbs. Do you guys have some bulbs on your wish list that you're going to be ordering? I always love allium. Have you ever had the giant allium? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're my favorite. And, you know, we ordered those. Jamie and I ordered a whole bunch of those together. They came up two years, and this year they didn't come up. Yeah. Do you think the very, voles got them? Nope. 
I really don't. Just too wet. We had a bizarre spring. Yeah. I don't know. The smaller ones all came back, but the great big huge ones did not. I have a question about your allium. Is it normal for the tips of the leaves to turn brown? On some of them, yes. Okay. There's certain varieties that will do that. Um, and I only know that because when Jamie and I were looking on what we were going to order together, to put our order together, some of the descriptions actually talked about that. Okay. That it's normal for those to do that. Then is it okay to, to just snip the browned ends off of the leaves? I don't think that would be a problem. I think about, I think about my chive, and they're in the onion family as well. And any time my chives start to look shaggy or brown or anything... I'll cut off the affected area, or specifically with my chive, I'll take it right back to the ground. And that I probably do that two or three times a summer because it starts to flop over. Mm -hmm. Who do you order from? Who do you order your bulbs from? Who do you like? I'm trying to think of the place where we ordered our bulbs from, Jamie. Was it Vander? Vandenberg. Vandenberg. Yeah, Vandenberg Bulb Company. Yep. They say that they're wholesale, and if you check their prices against, you know, other catalogs like, you know, I won't name a brand, but other catalogs you get in the mail, they're definitely cheaper. But how do you order from a wholesale? I thought you that just, was just order. They send out the catalogs. Mm-hmm. Let's talk mulch. I like the, oh gosh, now I can't think of what it is because it doesn't float away, it stays in place. Well, speaking of that, Lance at Hedberg had that new product called Mulch Grip. Oh, yeah. That you can spray on mulch. And it keeps the mulch in place. It makes it sticky so it sticks together and the wind doesn't blow it around. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to getting it because you can spray it on pea gravel. And it helps keep the pea gravel in place. And for anybody who's ever had steppers surrounded by pea gravel, uh, keep a broom close because that's pretty much all you'll do, especially with kids, is just sweep the pea gravel off the steppers. It drives you crazy. We have like granite pieces and stuff on a walk that we have. And then we put rubber mulch around it, the little broken up pieces of rubber mulch. Yeah. And it doesn't stay in place either. I don't think anything will, honestly. I wonder if that would work for rubber mulch as well. I don't know, but that would be a fun product to look into because, Mm -hmm. um, especially as we get into fall, we're out there cleaning up our gardens. Yeah, we're doing it right now. We're redoing our, you know, in between the, the stones right now. I mean, I think it would be great to use on the edge on a pathway where the mulch does go onto the sidewalk or yeah. onto your driveway or, or into the grass, but not necessarily through the whole the whole bed, which was probably more cost-effective anyway. Really just spray it where you need it. Mm-hmm. It says that um, it can prevent rain or wind from eroding mulch for months. But obviously you would need to reapply it. And it works on mulch, pine straw, dirt, sand, pebbles, gravel, grade on slopes, planting beds, and around trees. It's a protective coating to the surface in the upper layer of the mulch. Does it, I, is it shiny when you spray it on? No. It looks, I mean, to me it looks pretty much the same. And is that how you apply it? By using one of those? Like a sprayer. Yeah. yeah. Like a Hudson sprayer? Yep. You can buy them in the little bottle, like a little bottle, and just spray it from the bottle, or you can put it in a sprayer. You buy it, it like in a concentrate? Yep. You can put buy it in a one gallon or a two and a half gallon, and then you just apply it. That'd be really neat. I, I'm definitely going to think about trying that. Yeah. It says, do not apply if rain is in the immediate forecast. I'm sure to just wash it off so it probably needs to dry. Sure. So if you're going to apply it, turn your sprinklers off, too, because... Mm-hmm. You know they have it down at Hedberg, and you can find it online at mulchgrip.com. But I love cocoa bean mulch. I I'm, do, too. I'm partial to cocoa bean mulch just because as I get older, it's easy to apply. It's little, and um, I love the chocolate smell for a couple of days afterwards. Um, but I like any mulch that I can move around with a broom. Mm-hmm. So, And you know what? Cocoa bean mulch works wonderful in my cottage garden, too. Can you buy cocoa bean mulch in bulk? Oh, yeah. You buy it, like, in two cubic feet bags. Um, Lines has it. And I think it's, like, two cubic feet, so only, like, five ninety nine. Yeah. But you can't buy it not in a bag? Like a dump truck comes I've in? never seen it that way. Okay. Have I you? I, I get mine at Menards. Oh, you do? Mm-hmm. Oh, but do you still have to put four inches of mulch? You know what? Or I would I don't. say don't um, no. because I okay. actually applied my cocoa bean mulch too heavy in certain areas and it starts to kind of mold. Yeah. 
and it gets kind of mushy and gushy. So I would say a lighter. In fact, I know I really uh, smothered some plants in my garden, which actually probably was a good thing because I was overgrown in a lot of areas. But um, I wouldn't do it as heavy as I did last fall. So Yeah, and I always just do it real light. I mean, you know, not light, but just so it just starts to cover the soil. So and you know it's kind of reddish brownish color. It's a really so you can color. it's very pretty. So you yeah. know when you put it down you see it. And um and it, it's just a way to get some organics into my garden. Right. Well, I don't use the cocoa bean because of my dog pirate. Because it's poisonous to dogs. Right. So I and I just don't want to take the chance. Yeah. Although we know Sunny the perfect dog doesn't eat the cocoa mulch. <laughs> Sunny laying at our feet right now does not is not interested in that. Right. Now if I hand fed it to him, he would eat it. <laughs> well, coming back to this cocoa bean mulch, I'm actually on the national cocoshell.com website. And it says it lasts longer, smells better, and gets darker with age. It retains moisture better than regular mulch and is an excellent insulator for root systems in the winter and summer. They also talk about spreading it an inch thick. That sounds about right. Well, and when I was digging up the plants in your yard with your cocoa bean mulch, it was great for digging around too. Oh, yeah, it's great. Uh, it for me being an older gardener now, someone who I, I'm not on my knees out there. I don't enjoy that. It's easy to move. It's easy to put down. It's easy to carry in the bag. So to me, there's that's my go-to mulch. Now, do you guys buy hanging baskets this summer? And if so, what did you buy? And are you liking them? I did not buy any this year. Okay. Jamie's out. <laughs> I buy tons of hanging baskets, but I put mine into pots. I have the little tiny petunia ones that have been just phenomenal this year the million bells million uh, bells thank I you i love million yes. bells yep awesome they're a profuse bloomer and it lasts all summer long i had a and few, doing well in the in the heat yeah and i had a fuchsia one last year and it really was stunning mm-hmm. i i had um i have four hanging baskets i like to put under my deck I had a few dead spots, and I bought some morning glory. And so I filled the dead spots with morning glory, and now I have these pots that are spilling over, but then also growing up. In fact, the morning glory are so aggressive, they're growing up the hanging pot and then up onto the deck. Oh, pretty. Oh, pretty. Above. So that's pretty. been a really nice, fun thing this year for me. Into your kitchen garden? Into the kitchen garden on the deck. It's fun to see the morning glory just appear, you know, a story off the ground here are these morning glory coming so. i have always had blue ones and this year i got i bought red ones i bought red ones too aren't they gorgeous yeah they're really pretty oh. i did mine in my uh container for the maple grove garden tour oh you did where i had it with the the rainforest sunrise hosta and i came up with my little story about walking through the rainforest at sunrise and and I took the whole theme throughout the day. I'm glad you shared this now because obviously we were too exhausted today. <laughs> yes, that's great. Yes, I can email you that story if yeah. you like. Take a picture of it and we'll put it on the post. I have a rose bush shrub that's called Hope for Humanity. I'll tell you what, the roses on it are amazing. They're like long stem roses hmm. and I cut them and bring them in the house constantly and every time I prune it back like I mean half of it you know take half of it down and cut all the roses off and bring them and fill up a huge vase yeah. two weeks later I have roses again it's really? just the most amazing what's it called it's called hope for humanity and hope it's from for humanity Ca- and it's from Canada oh, and I we bought bad. it at Bachman's gorgeous gorgeous i brought i brought a picture of the vase of the roses in to show a girl at work and she couldn't believe it i mean it it is the most profuse bloomer i have ever seen i'm pulling up pictures of it now it's red yes absolutely gorgeous yes look at the roses and you get a single rose and then you'll get bunches of roses all you know all on the same plant does anybody have curly willow? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, tell me all about it. What's it like to grow? My mother passed away uh, four and a half years ago, quite suddenly. And I got my gardening love from her and from her mother. And at mom's funeral service, there was a lovely floral arrangement, and there happened to be curly willow twigs in it. 
And I rooted them. And this was in February. So that summer, I, they had beautiful roots on them. I stuck them in a pot. They did nothing. I threw them out in my compost pile. You're kidding. Not kidding. The next spring, I come out, and there they are, all leafed out. Dig it out of the compost pile, and I plant it in my garden. Now, a year later, it is this tree, and You're it's kidding. taking over. It's huge. Wow. So, Love once again, story. I got one of the neighbor boys, and we dug it up, yep. and we were not very gentle in our digging, and we went, we live on a wetlands, we put it back in the wetlands, and it's thriving. I also have a twisted willow tree, also. Oh, what's that like? Absolutely. It's one of my favorite trees. I just love them. They're messy, though. It's not something you want in your front yard. Speaking of trees, I have a white oak on the front of my property that did not come back this year. Phil kept telling me it was dead, and I kept saying, no, no. And it's really big. It's a big tree. I bet that's a three-inch, yeah. four-inch yeah, we tree were looking at it diameter. Today. You, you noticed my dead tree? Yes. Thanks, ladies. And I was wondering <laughs> why it died, because it didn't know. look, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I think if you just went out to the edge of the of the drip line and just take a shovel and dig all the way around it It'll and just out. start working that stem back and forth, oh, you'll get it out. You wouldn't even cut it down. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure you will. Oh, oh yes. you would cut it down yes. first. But I would leave enough of it there so you can grab it oh, and okay. just start digging around it. Just all where right. you're where the drip line is dig around it and then just start working it back and forth okay a fulcrum you want to have a fulcrum and you know when we came tonight i looked and i it doesn't appear to like you planted it too deep it looks like it was planted properly well unless it had girdling roots that were in the pot and when you get a pot a potted tree or ball and burlap you should dig down until you find remove the soil on the top until you find that main stem, and then when you plant it, you only want about two inches of dirt on it. It takes about 10 to 20 years, and if a tree is planted too deep, it will die. Or if it has the girdling roots. And a lot of times, you know, if you take a tree out of the out of the container, and you see the roots growing in a circle around in that container, because it's been in there too long, you have to fix that before you plant it. And most most people don't know that. I didn't know that back then, 12 years ago. How do you fix it? Let's walk people through that if they see that in a tree that they buy. Well, you need to you need to gently loosen up the roots that are growing in a circle and try to get them to pull pull them down straight. Sometimes you actually have to cut some. That's of them. what I was going to ask. Can you cut? If them? you have to, well, you don't want to, but if you have to, because if you plant it and they're growing in a circle, yeah. it's going to kill the tree anyway. Yeah. And they say when you buy a tree, pull it out of the container and look at the roots before you buy it. And ball and burlap trees, you think you're getting such a great deal. A lot of times they'll have three feet of root, three feet of dirt or two feet of dirt on top of those main roots. And then you plant it and it's way too deep right away. I never thought of pulling back the burlap and finding that main root, but it is so important. You just assume that the nurseries do it right. Mm-hmm. Do you have dividing dividing perennials that are on your list? Still be. Yep. I have some astobies I need to split. I have some hostas I need to split. And I have um, my very favorite plant is red bee balm. And I want to bring some up into one of my other gardens. So I'm going to dig some out and move it up to another garden where I need some red splashes of color. So techniques for digging out bee balm. Do you just dig a clump and move I it? I do, yeah. Bee balm, is, is it grows very shallow, the roots. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to dig very deep. You know, my favorite smell is uh, Monarda. Is the bee balm? <gasps> bee balm? Oh I my god, I love it. Sitting by bee balm, and I love planting bee mm-hmm. balm. I just love that smell. I bought a new color. I have white, pink, red, purple, and I bought like a magenta red. It's almost a purplish red color. It is just like bam, really mm. pretty. Do you oh. know that if you take your red bee balm and go cut it and put it in a vase? As it begins to fade, it turns the most gorgeous pink. Really? You don't even know the flower is fading because it's so pretty. You think it's that's the color it is. Huh. You have to you have to do it. You have I to go will. cut some of your red bee balm, bring it in the house, put it in a vase. Yeah. It is just amazing. I will. When it starts to yeah. fade, it is the prettiest pink. Huh. 
I keep thinking I want to try making tea out of it because it's edible. Mm. I've never done it, but I'm going to one of these days. And how about the astilbe? Do you guys have a I just I like? kind of just slice it out like you do a hosta. It's a little bit harder. They're kind of tough. You They're gotta get dense. the shovel through them. Very dense. How are those how are that? those flowers coming that you've been planting in your woods? They are not coming very well only because I forget about them and okay, let me take that back. I don't forget about them. I remember the mosquitoes. Uh, and I yes. don't want to go into the woods <laughs> to water them. I was looking at a sprinkler earlier today, and it's just one of those oscillating sprinklers that you just set on the ground. And this this baby shoots thirty feet. Wow! It was it was like a it was really something. So if you put something like that, if you planted stuff in your, that would be it, a really smart idea. And just turn on the sprinkler for a while. Yeah. Then you don't have to deal with the skeeters. Right. Yeah. Tell them about the customized. Uh, sprinkler or hose guard that you are having made? So let's see. At one of the gardens, one of our volunteers, his name is Ted Kapachek, and he does stone benches where he will find a flat rock and then create a bench with the flat rock for your garden. And you can choose the color that you want and the style of the stone that you want. And he will go search it out. One day, I was in my woods trying to water my flowers, and I was pulling the hose. The hose was breaking off all of the flowers that were close to the path. Oh. And so I thought, I need to get hose guards out here. But I want something that looks natural. So I thought, how about if Ted takes some stones and drills a hole in them and puts rebar in them, and then the top stone, he only drills halfway through it, and we use that as a cap. And so I mentioned this to Ted, and the next day he came over to my house with this hose guard and said, because you were the one who came up with this idea, you can have this for free. It's the prototype of this hose guard. Oh, cool. And I love it. It's in my woods. It looks natural. I have a picture of it, and I'll put it mm-hmm. on the post as well. They're just adorable. Yes. They are. And, and so now he's making five more for me. Yeah. He Neat. could uh, he could make those and have an Etsy shop online and yeah, sell them. Yeah, an excellent idea. Because yeah. it's so cute. Everybody's going to want them. He also does rock bubblers, too. He will oh, make rock bubblers. Rock. Did he make your rock bubbler? Um, he did not drill the hole in that rock. I bought that rock huh. um, after my dad died. That was part of his garden. But I dug the hole, and I made the rock bubbler. I dug the hole and put the thing in this four by four piece of plastic and my husband put a rebar in the hole of the rock and pulled it across the yard wow Wow. and then we placed it just exactly how we wanted it and i've been going out and finding rocks just to fill in around it yeah i know i'm impressed thank you very impressed how about uh house plants they're all outside all your house plants are outside well august is a good time to start moving them back in Mm mm-hmm what do you have out there? Christmas cactus and my jade is out there doing very well. I have Hoyas that I put outside, but I can't have them in direct sun because mm-hmm. they get burned. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, spider mites, love those darn Hoyas. It's like you have a Hoya, you have spider mites. They yeah. just go together. I have, um, I overwinter my mint plants in a pot and my you rosemary do? and my bay leaves. And I put them in a nice ornamental pot, put them on my deck in the summer, and bring them in in the winter, and they grow okay in the winter. But then I bring them back out, and they come back every wow, year. Wow, I'm impressed. And my lemon tree, too. That yes, I, your lemon tree. Yeah, that has scale. Yeah, and how's I, it doing? Mm-hmm. It's better. All the, It lost most of the leaves this winter, and it's leafed out again this summer, but it still has scale on it. But I do every once in a while see little birds sit on the branches and try to pick off the scale. Oh, good. Yeah. I had a bougainvillea tree that I wintered for five years. Wow. And the scale, and I had English ivy in the bottom of the pot, and the the aphids and the scale finally won this winter. I have a succulent wreath I made this year. Yes, I, I love those. I love that. I do too. Now, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it this winter. I'll tell you what I do with mine. Are they perennial succulents yes. or are they annual? They're I've the got perennial? A little, they're perennial. 
So what I do with mine, and I learned this from the great Maple Grove gardener, Carmen Overson, Mm -hmm. and what she does with hers, and now what I do with mine is I um, lay it on the ground, and then I cover it with mulch, Mm -hmm. and then I dig it out in the spring, and you won't believe it when you dig it out in the spring, it has actually grown over the winter. Um, I had somebody tell me that the succulents actually grow in Minnesota up until December, and then they're dormant until about March, and they start growing again. So I have a strawberry pot that I have um, hen and chicks in, Mm -hmm. and I'll take the whole pot and bury it. Mm. And then when I pull it out in the spring, it's just even more. Oh, you're kidding. It's crazy. It's even more covered in (sighs) in babies. And And two years ago, I had a strawberry pot that was covered with hens and chicks. Yeah. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah. And I brought it in and tried to overwinter it, and it wasn't doing good. And somebody told me to put it in my garage. Oh, did you do it? And it did really well in the garage, but then... Come about spring, it just kind of rotted. Rotted. Yeah. No, I bury them. Just bury them in the ground. They do the fabulous. whole pot. Bury the entire pot in mulch. So, like, I'll dig a hole. I'll dig a, a hole. Like, if you imagine laying that that pot on its side. So, what is that? About twelve inches. And I'll kind of dig a little shallow trench for it, and then I cover it in mulch. I'll cover like it. Like wood mulch? Yeah. What really? I yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, and they all come back fabulous. And Mary Lynn knows that I have pots that are on my south patio, and it's all perennial succulents, and I don't do anything with them because my south patio is covered in rock, so it's kind of a little microclimate, and I, I bet it's zone five on my patio. Mm-hmm. And um, so I started putting um, hardy succulents, put them in my um, containers back there, and I don't do anything. And they wow. come back, and I never now I never have to buy anything. I was always putting annuals in them, and I got tired because it's so much money, you know, if you're wandering around with every container and it's got to mm-hmm. have an annual. My other trick is I have um, about a, t- a two-foot pot and I can put autumn. I have found that I can put autumn joy sedum in those two foot pots, you know, like a decent sized pot, a ten inch container, and they'll overwinter in the pot. Oh wow! wow. And then that's and you don't another, have to bury that. No, and that's another container that I found that I can just have out, and it'll come back every year, and yes. I love it. And every year it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it just fills the pot even more. Wow. What's the container made out of? Uh, the one that I am thinking about is like a resin. Really? Mm-hmm. I'm so surprised. Yeah. And like we were talking previously with that Autumn Joy, do you cut it back before? I used to do a better job of cutting it back. Once I found that I could cut the top of the Autumn Joy and then get new plants just from that, I was doing it all the time. Mm-hmm. And then now I'm over that. And so if I cut them back now, I usually just cut it and pitch the top. And mm-hmm. I just do it usually up until about the 4th, like I do with my aster, um, so that they don't get so leggy. Well, ladies, I want to thank you for a great Master Gardener Roundtable. Next time we get together, it will be September, and I'm sure we'll be really thinking about the cleanup that's needed in our gardens. So, Planting our spring bulbs. And planting our spring bulbs, and maybe what we'll do is we'll have a fun... Um, uh, 10 or 12 minute session on the bulbs that we're going to order. Maybe we could do it together. That would be fun. That'd be fun. Can All right, we girls. order them then? Well, we could even order them live on our podcast. Really? <laughs> Bye, ladies. We'll okay. see you. Okay, thanks. thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. All right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it for our show today. I want to thank Mary Lynn Kenknight, Jamie Sled, and Marilyn Arnland for being part of our first Master Gardener Roundtable, which we will be doing every other month here on Still Growing. You can find this podcast on iTunes as well as Stitcher and the Blackberry Podcast. You can also subscribe directly to the blog post to get them via email. I'll have all the information from the show today at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A. And you can find this episode in the top menu under the Still Growing Podcast. You can always find me at sixfootmama.com or on facebook.com backslash still growing with six foot mama. You can also email me directly at jennifer at sixfootmama.com. 
Feel free to send your questions in for the Master Gardener Roundtable, which airs every other month on Still Growing. Your question will be answered either via email or during the podcast. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebeling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is an hour-long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. More? You want more? Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. Wait. Hey, Jamie. Hi, Marilyn. Hi. Hi. And what's your name? Who are you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Who are you? Mm-hmm. Well, well, since you asked. <laughs> Mary Lynn, that sounds like a fabulous class. <clears throat> Thank you. Are you looking forward to it? <laughs> Thank you, she says, beyond the mic. <laughs> No, I mean, good. louder than the ice cubes, though. I won't do that again. I'm you sorry. Can, you can do the ice cube. We'll deal with it. No. It happens. It's real life recording here. My stomach was gurgling, too. Did you hear that? No, that I oh, did okay. not hear. <laughs> okay, Jamie, did you have something from your garden you want to share? Weeds. Weeds, weeds. Okay. So, does that mean they're really a weed? Or is it a flower that I don't remember planting? I don't know the answer to either of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tree. It kind of looks like asparagus on the top. And then it's pink. Oh, the willow? Nope. Not the one that was in, on the parade float? Nope. Magnolia? Nope. Smoke bush? Nope. But it's a shrub? Uh, or is it a, a shrub or a tree or a perennial or something? Well, can you narrow it down a little bit? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to make the blooper real. <laughs> <laughs> so it has pink tips at the end yeah of the it has green. pink it's, it's like queen of the prairie it gets fireweed no you think might be Ugh. but, but that's fireweed but it's invasive no it's not invasive oh people plant it to me it looks like asparagus that at the top has pink let us know asparagus doesn't get pink at the top no it's <laughs> and what's your name who are you <laughs> It's like, it looks like asparagus. Okay. Except it has pink. Imagine if the tip... The tip, not the not, not when it grows out. Right, not when it grows okay. out. It's just the tip. Oh. Yes. More wine, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Sunny's lips. Okay. And so I, through my research, um, I found that it could also be possibly a mag... Manganese? No. Magnesium? No. 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 Manganese? No. Manganese? No. No. Manganese? No. No. Manganese? Manganese. Oh. Manganese. There's an N. Manganese. Manganese. (laughs) Manganese. I think that my soil was more basic and that they did like... No, because you have the basic soil. Okay, I think they do like acid soil more. No. Was it a sugary soil then? Alkaline soil? No. 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 Does it say if it's alkaline? No, because you have the basic soil. Okay, I think they do like acid soil more. Alkaline soil is sweet, so... So what is... Acid soil is bitter. Is Maybe it... it was the deer. No, because it is the one pl- the one plant that the deer went towards the tomato. Oh. there. There's just so much gardening to be done that to spend that much time on just one plant... I hate to say, it's going to get sacrificed. Oh, oh no. Is Maybe it, it was the deer. Oh. I was planting some plants, and then I I was taking some things to my compost, and I saw some weeds, so I got distracted <laughs> and started pulling weeds, and I never did get the rest of my plants pulled. Oh, oh no. Okay, I have a question about that. Do you think it would affect the rain permeating through the mulch at all? Yes. No. Nope. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I planted the tomato plants two weeks ago. Do you think that would be an issue? Uh, yes. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lovely curly willow story. They were so big this year, they were covering my path, and I couldn't take it anymore. Which is the case for a lot of things, even good things. Is Maybe it, it was the deer. Yeah. He's a little bit of a baby, so... My Maybe son? Like, no! Okay, good. No. Maybe it, it was the deer. That's some special deer you got. That's right. That one deer. 
Have you found or has anybody ever seen any mulch? Uh, yes. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> we planted these trees. In fact, I went and bought all these dang trees. Oh. There you guys look at them. Oh, that's so cute. Oh my gosh, what are those? Yes. They're definitely an alien. <laughs> <laughs> and so I left it, and so far the tomato plant is surviving. Do you think that would be an issue? Uh, yes. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so you so, know they're out there, but you're not going that's to... That's right, that's right. There's a limit to my dedication to those plants, unfortunately. Oh. No. And the asparagus fern? Yes. I just can't go that direction these days. Yeah. Oh, no. I still have pansies. You do? That are doing gorgeous. You do? I do. On my back deck. And that's just so unheard of. You do? I do. This, and I know. In this heat. You do? I do. Here's the scar. From your, from poison wow. ivy? Poison ivy, no. And my, may I just say, you are very limber. <laughs> You just, at night. you just hoisted that baby right up. Would you like mm. a photograph of my scar to post? Sorry, I can't help you there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Mary Lynn. What email list are you on yeah. that the rest yeah. of us aren't on? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but can you imagine going to Cuba? Uh, yes. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, Beyonce got to see him. Is Maybe it? it was the deer. <laughs> Thanks, deer. I really appreciate you bringing this up at 10.55. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm starting to get slap happy. Excuse me, that we're looking at? Or are we flexible? I'm flexible. Not as flexible as you, but I'm <laughs> flexible. <laughs> Why am I thinking of feet? You were in the bathroom. Right. <laughs> you were in the bathroom, Mar Marilyn. But she showed us her poison ivy, and I mean, her leg practically oh, went that. behind her. Oh, I saw <laughs> oh my god! I don't know. Maybe it's something about the thirty-six inch inseam that prohibits me. I can do the splits. You can. seriously? Oh, Lord, okay, let me see. Do that. Um, no, I don't. Feel... So you really can do the splits oh, yeah. with both legs? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> So you really can do the splits? Oh, yeah. Why? Were you a gymnast? <laughs> Mary Lynn so goes immediately to the professional. <laughs> Were you a gymnast? <laughs> I was a cheerleader. Did you do the one that goes left, 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 right, left? Does that sound familiar? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> It no. sounds familiar, but not. it's more like for MASH, not for cheerleading. <laughs> it's for football. And then you go, my back aches, my belt's too tight, my hips shake from left to right. Say, ooh, Angawa, Mohawk's got the superpower. Were you a cheerleader too? No, sorry, I wasn't. I just know the cheers. <laughs> I, was, I was on dance line. Wow. I did that Which too. Which was a step below cheerleaders. It is a step Back below. in the old days. I'm no, sorry. now it's a step above. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's oh, a big yes. deal now. Yeah. And did you have the white boots? Yes. I still have my boots. <laughs> and oh, I had the white gloves. God. With tassels. Oh, I didn't have tassels. Oh. Okay. Okay, did you have the special gloves that were colored on one side and white on no. the other? Oh, did you do this sort of thing? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. More? You want more? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish people could see what you just did. <laughs>